I want to introduce our panel, and I, we've got a, a great panel that ex, that not only represents different segments and different parts of the payments and banking industry, um, but also represents many different provinces across the Canadian landscape. So this is a, a good representation of that. So let me begin with uh, Barb McLean, who's the VP of Integrations and Analytics at Solero, and she is located in the province of Manitoba, right? You got it. All right. Well, Barbara, could you just tell us a little bit about what you do at Solero? And then I'll introduce our next one. You bet. So Solero is a payments and banking and technology company, primarily serving credit unions and other financial institutions here in Canada. My team specifically focuses on uh, where we can best use the data estate that credit unions have, how we can deliver those insights in real time to credit unions and their members, and ensuring that we have the most resilient, secure, and performant uh, kind of systems that we can use to deliver that. Awesome. Thank you very much. Moving to the top right, uh, we've got Tracy Lagasse from Azure, who's an industry executive for financial services, and um, she is in the province of Ontario, right? I am. I am. Thank you, Lance. I'm in Ontario, although I am from Halifax, just in case there's some East Coasters, you know, dialing into your segment. Um, but my role at Microsoft is that as the industry executive covering the financial services market. Um, that means I work with banks, credit unions, insurers, pension funds, capital markets, coast to coast. And really what it's about is connecting these large industry trends with whether it's first party Microsoft solutions or awesome partners like we have on, on the uh, panel today in helping them accelerate their digital transformation journeys around big things like payments modernization or open banking as an example. So pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Tracy. And then bottom right corner, we'll move over to the, our West Coast representative, Dion Dubé, ABP at uh, Canadian Western Bank over infrastructure. Dion, uh, give us a little background on what you do. Yeah, thanks for that, and happy to be here with uh, with everyone. Looking forward to uh, uh, chatting with all and and seeing what questions are being asked. So, so Canadian Western Bank is a is a you know diversified financial services organization specializing in banking, trust, and wealth management. And since 1984, we've been uh, based out of Edmonton and have grown from a single branch back in those days uh, to a you know to a fully federally regulated financial institution institution with a national presence. And so uh, it's been a fantastic journey. I've been with the bank uh, now just over a year. And in my role, I'm here to lead the infrastructure teams and uh, prepare ourselves for the uh, ongoing growth that CWB is experiencing. So uh, uh, again, happy to be here and uh, look forward to uh, uh, this session. All right, well, thank you, Dion. And my name is Lance Homer. I'll be the moderator for this panel. I work for Equinix. We are the world's digital infrastructure company. We operate several data centers across the Canadian landscape in eight different metros. And not only um, am I here to talk about kind of my role, which is leading our digital payments and banking ecosystem um, across the globe, but to talk about the partnership that we have with Azure and talk about two great customers that both Azure and Equinix share, which are Solero and CWB, and talk about how they're using digital infrastructure to transform their businesses. Um, one from a perspective of someone who um, works more on the application side, Barb, and someone who works more on the infrastructure side, Dion, one from an ISV, Barb, and one from a bank. And having different customers, different, different geographical footprints, different kind of needs, we hope that we can kind of share with you best practices and also kind of trends that both uh, myself and Tracy are seeing in the marketplace and also talk about one of the major trends that we're seeing, which is sustainability as part of kind of how this digital transformation is occurring here in the space. So let me just um, begin. I'm, I'm pulling up a, a, a map here. Uh, hopefully you see it on the screen now. Um, this is a map of the global locations where Equinix operates. Um, while this is a Canadian conference, I think the two things that are important to, to know about this is that um, you may, may operate exclusively in Canada like Solero or CW, CWB does, but you may have need for a global footprint or you may have partners or customers that are coming to you and need to connect to you globally. Um, Equinix is 
a global co-location provider who has digital infrastructure that can help you uh, connect your infrastructure around the world, but also excitedly connect to the cloud service providers that you that you use. And I'm really happy to trace you on this call because Azure is a, is, is a key partner for Equinix and being able to connect to Express Route for having low latency connectivity securely connect has been critical to many of the financial service customers that we serve, in particular, uh, Solero and CWB. So um, I will uh, take this off and um, get into kind of talking to uh, our, our two panelists that are from uh, Solero and CWB because we want to hear their stories. And Teresa and I will just kind of add some commentary here and there. But let's start with you, Barb. And maybe um, can you talk about what were the outcomes that Solero wanted to achieve with with transforming their business? What you know, what what got you intersecting with Azure and Equinix to you know do these things? Well, for us, it actually starts with um, the end member. So we don't really offer a lot of services that intersect with uh, the members of our credit unions. We do have a digital banking platform that we offer. And of course, um, everyone knows the expectations of the customers are from any uh, application that they consume today, whether it's on Amazon or Netflix, that informs their expectations of the kind of services that their bank or credit union would deliver. Uh, the majority of Solero, of course, deals directly with the financial institutions. And so when we were looking across the landscape of what was coming next, it actually was the kind of typical outcomes you might expect. You need to be faster on our behalf. Uh, you know, you need to be able to deliver the kind of future ready services our members are asking us to deliver to them. And you need to be able to do it in a cost effective way. Of course, the primary set of, of financial institutions we deal with uh, trend much smaller on the uh, scale of, of the kind of investments they can make in technology. And so one of the roles Solero plays is to help scale that across the, the credit union landscape. And so being able to respond to the better, faster, more cost efficient was really some of our drivers. We knew that we also needed to be able to continue to invest in our platforms. Um, it's something I'm sure that is close to Dion and team's heart. You actually you know, can't not invest in continuing to modernize what you have. Um, so many things uh, you know, that we would have put in place a decade ago are obsolete. You know, if they still exist, they definitely are right for replacement. Um, and so as you're looking to then modernize the tech stack underneath everything that delivers your services, you need to ensure that you're working with strong partners that can help you do that, especially when you're an organization like Solero. We're a relatively small team. We are made stronger by our partnerships. So while we were trying to evaluate what to do next with our services to better uh, deliver on behalf of credit unions and others, um, you know, we started to quickly evaluate where do all of those workloads need to live. We've traditionally run all of our services out of our own data centers in Calgary and Winnipeg. And that served us well uh, up until recently. And, you know, no secret, we can't possibly invest to the scale that a Microsoft can in security, sustainability, you know, the kinds of capabilities that that partner can bring. And so it started to make these kinds of choices very obvious. And the intersection of Microsoft with the Azure platform and Equinix with the national fabric that are delivered are actually obvious, right? There's a vast territory that we have to deliver on. Um, we serve about 500 branch locations across the number of credit unions that we serve. And they tend to be in some very interesting and potentially far flung places. So how do you actually get that data as close to those customers as you can. And one of the ways that we can do that is, of course, through the, through the Equinix fabric and the intersection of where that lives with Azure Express Routes. Yeah, I, I, uh, great, great intro. I, I, I looked up, I, I, didn't, I didn't say which province from Canada I'm from. I'm from the southern province of Utah in the, the US, but uh, we're glad to be <laughs> included. Please don't kick me off uh, today's call because I'm not, um, but, um, you know, you mentioned just the vast landscape of connecting to your across it, it's uh, 9,300 kilometers wide it's wide as part of Canada and, and like nearly 10 million square kilometers so you know it's it, it's a challenge I mean to to uh, provide connectivity and get latency out to all that uh, edge 
I'm going to switch over to you, Dion. Um, uh, same kind of question here, noting that you are in a different growth trajectory um, at CWB, and also your end customer is is is, is consumers versus um, banks. So maybe t tell me a little bit about um, you know what were the objectives that you were looking at when you began this transformation, and also again you're from the infrastructure side, and how does that apply to the people that are in your team that are, are that are, are your company that are like Barb, who are the apps? Uh, side of the house how do you how did you support them yeah great question and our journey is um, is a bit different uh, when I first came in I did a quick evaluation of you know the infrastructure landscape that we had at CWB and uh, understood sort of where we're going uh, from a growth um, trajectory you know looked at the age of our infrastructure and um, there was a clear sort of uh, play for to be uh, to be made there to get us ready for uh, the future. We had a couple of our own uh, owned uh, data centers uh, and of course we now know that those are uh, you know costly and difficult to maintain and they're not terribly agile should you need to uh, grow them uh, or shrink them quickly. Um, and as well, we had uh, started down the path and are continuing down the path uh, uh, with a public cloud provider who is also Azure um, in our in our environment. And so we needed to figure out how to uh, mesh all of those scenarios together. And really the difference here is, is, is again, like you stated, I'm looking at this from a pure infrastructure perspective and I, one of the things I wanted to do was disconnect our strategy from an infrastructure perspective from where the application teams were at right now. We know, or I'm hopeful that we will get them to the point where uh, they can leverage, you know, all the new technologies and everything that both private and public cloud can bring to the table, but I wasn't going to wait for that. So our uh, decision to go forward was based upon um, continuing with that agility and optionality is is super critical so uh, so the you know equinix was uh, was an ideal uh, partner for us from a uh, not just a colo um, data center perspective but the fact that um, the fabric the um, equinix fabric is, is so well connected and actually has a lot of our fi partners already on board was uh, was a really compelling story uh, and then add to that as well the um, ability to uh, leverage Equinix Metal, which is effectively private cloud IaaS, uh, was something that was really uh, good for us. So we felt that we had all the bases covered where we have a traditional like data center, but in a colo so that we don't have to manage all of the ins and outs of it. We can scale up or down quickly if we need more or less bandwidth or connectivity. All of that is, uh, generally speaking, very quick flip of a switch. Um, is this afternoon quick enough for you kind of scenario rather than weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, in a, and, and then add in the ability for us to scale up on private cloud IaaS. And then of course the, you know, the, the deep connectivity into Azure was something that uh, uh, just fit right in with everything that we were looking to achieve. Now, uh, where we're gonna end up running workloads is now going to depend on a formula which uh, will balance out performance and cost depending on the use case of the application. And I think that's an ideal uh, situation. So once the application owners um, bring, get themselves up to speed and, and we transform ourselves in that regard, uh, I strongly believe we have all our bases covered and uh, we'll see where things uh, actually uh, end up at. But right now it's, uh, it's, it's wide open. So we're pretty excited about that. Well, thanks for that answer there. I mean, um, as I, can I, I'm gonna go to you, Tracy, just a second here and talk to you about trends and, and what you heard from, from Barb and Dion. But, um, you know, I, I heard you both owned and operated your own data centers. And this move to cloud and to Equinix was driven by several things. And, and, and I know, Tracy, you've got your, your take on the, the transfer out there. But what I hear is, is this, that the digital infrastructure, things that you didn't have to own, that you could consume as a service, whether it was Equinix Fabric, which is 
a software defined network API driven that connects the Equinix footprint is, is one of those things you brought up Equinix metal, um, which is our bare metals as service. Another kind of rather than going out and buying hardware, you could, you know, if you don't want private, you could do that. Um, or um, we have a network edge services. So, you know, it's, it's more than just space and power for co-location. It's being able to have a platform for innovation and doing it in different metrics. One of the things that we're seeing here in the, in the industry is, is that when you own your own data center, you want you, you try to bring everything, all, all your infrastructure into one or two sites um, and pull this network all back and all your data back to those two sites. The, the trends you heard that the, the outcomes that Barb and Dion were, were aiming for, is that what you're seeing at Azure and what other trends are you seeing? Yeah. Um, so some of the, you know, the, I'll try not to duplicate really um, what, you know, Barb and Dion are saying, but, you know, what a couple of things that really stand out when I listen to um, our customers um, talk um, and really is that shift, you know, you know, we talked, you know, Dion, you're now in a position where you can do that cost benefit analysis and make those decisions about where to run workloads. But the TCO of these types of decisions is, is I don't I don't want to say it's secondary, but what I'm hearing you guys actually talk about is delivering on member experience, um, creating the agility um, for your business and your partners to launch new products, to scale effectively, to take advantage of the investments um, that cloud providers, uh, Microsoft or cloud providers in general, are making in terms of security and scale. And those really are the trends that we are seeing across the industry. Um, and the, a couple of the other things, especially since we are talking within the financial services industry, a couple of the other benefits is shifting some of that responsibility as it relates to compliance and regulatory um, requirements as well. It, it does create a few additional interesting conversations now around whether it's data portability, which is driving modularity of, of how you're actually implementing these things or, or data portability and, and disaster recovery. Um, so there's a bunch of other things. And, and one of the other um, key areas that we're also seeing really topical now is, and this was is a little bit shocking, though, I'll say Toronto, because I'm not sure of the stat all the way across Canada, but for the first time coming out of COVID, so in Toronto, there were 50,000 more tech jobs created than graduates. And so the actual demand for that financial institutions and the competition for um, tech skills um, is, is really top of mind. So there's a couple of things in terms of being able to ensure um, the tech um, employees you have are focused on tasks they like working on, so cloud infrastructure as opposed to potentially uh, legacy, and attracting those, those new those new skill sets. So shift some of the work that maybe isn't as high value um, and attract new employees. So the talent side is something. I'll, I'll I'll pause. You know, there's a whole sustainability thing. I'll you know maybe Lance we can throw in before there, but just as just as our customers are looking to take advantage of investments Microsoft made in security and Equinix made in national fabrics. There's also a huge benefit in taking advantage of the investments companies like Microsoft are doing in sustainability. Um, but we can maybe come back to that one. I appreciate your insights into the, the trends there. Um, and um, I, you brought up sustainability and if within the session, title of the session, um, you talk about digital infrastructure and as well as being green, being important. Um, last Friday was Earth Day. And if you're like me, um, the, each year that passes, the older I get, um, the, the greater desire I have to be a, a better steward over the resources I use on this earth. And it's neat to see that the world is changing that way. And, and most of the banks that, that we work with have goals of, to achieve by 2030 of how, they, how carbon neutral they want to be. Um, Equinix's goal is to be 100% renewable resources um, by 2030. We're at 90 plus percent already. And um, in 18 countries and 180 data centers around the world, we're already at 100%. And that's from, you know, starting in 2015, reducing things, our, car, our carbon usage by 50%. Um, but I think there, I, I see two things occurring with the move towards green. Um, one is, is just the, the, the dancing up of infrastructure of can I, can I put on a hyper-converged infrastructure and get the same amount of compute using less energy? Um, can I can I put it in a green data center? And I guess, and I guess the third part is, is this use of digital infrastructure. 
why go pay and, and, and have something be turned on if I'm not going to use it? So can I turn it up, turn it down as needed and only use it then and there? And I think that's the beauty of what, what you know, we're talking about today is that you can have hardware, network, compute, storage between Equinix and Azure in different markets that can accomplish that. So um, I'm going to start with Barb and ask you a little bit about the um, importance of sustainability from Solero, knowing that many of your end customers, the banks, care about making sure that they are part of that story. It's definitely true. And certainly we've seen, you know, in the credit unions specifically, uh, many of them are going to become and have become certified B Corps. We know this is a very important topic to its all. Uh, it's certainly important to credit unions and others that, you know, have this focus on their local communities. Like I know the team over at CWB certainly got their start in one and, you know, look at where they've come to. Um, you know, we can rely on partners like Equinix and Microsoft to help us here. Um, we know that the uh, IBX deployments in the three locations with Equinix that we already have are based on 100% renewable energy, right? Because that is what kind of investment Equinix is making. We're already able to leverage tools from Microsoft who we already know can make far greater investments in um, you know, efficiently run data centers as one example, but also then help us understand our scope one, two, and three usage. I'm very certain at some point the regulators are gonna be asking us all to report on this. So the sooner that we can understand it and use that data to inform our, our further decisions, uh, the better off we'll all be because it certainly aligns back to exactly the place that our customers are going. Maybe your end customers aren't asking for, for you to be green, but uh, a lot of the banks that we, we work with at Equinix, um, the end customers want investments. They want to know their bank's working towards that and have the investment opportunities and things of that nature. Maybe what's the importance for sustainability for CWB? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the expectations of, you know, most companies and most clients, regardless of what sector you're in, are to move towards, you know, some sort of sustainability play and CWB is absolutely no different. So, you know, from a CSR perspective, it's, it's very important uh, to us. And I think economies of scale is where we uh, need to drive that value and, and again, just sort of adopt and leverage the great work that's been done uh, by Equinix and by uh, Azure and, and Microsoft in that regard, right? I don't believe that there's any way we could replicate that sort of, um, you know, that sort of go forward, just doing it ourselves. So, so the fact that we, uh, have that as a criteria and I think both of your companies are doing a, a great visible job in that space is uh, only of benefit to us and uh, we are absolutely happy to uh, to leverage that because it's important not only for us um, as uh, employees in the company but uh, quite certain it's the expectations of our customers as well so thanks thanks Dion so Tracy I know that the, it's a high priority at Microsoft and Azure um, to, to build sustainable platforms and sustainable cloud environments. Maybe you can just tell us, share a little bit with, with us about how you guys are moving and helping uh, companies like Solero and CWB be yeah. green. As almost as much as I love payments, I love the topic of sustainability. Almost as much, sorry, Payments Canada. Sustainability is you know, getting right up there. Um, yeah, absolutely. The same, the same conversation that we started out with, you know, how to leverage the investments that others are making in order to achieve your business goals is the exact same story in sustainability. Microsoft is, was, car was carbon neutral in 2012. Some people are surprised um, by that. We'll be net zero by 2030. And we've actually further committed to remove all the carbon we've ever emitted since the creation of the company in, um, since creation of the company in 1975 by the year 2050. So for the customers that we work with, why not take advantage of that investment, that commitment, um, as you actually implement your projects as well. And we know that um, we've done studies with WSP, with Accenture, with Deloitte, some of the big consultancies as customers like CWB, as an example, migrate from on-prem to Equinix to cloud, depending on where you are in that journey, 
it is anywhere from 22% to 93% in terms of your carbon reduction that can be achieved. And that's through things like operations, through IT, through infrastructure, um, through renewable energy, those types of things you talked about. But then also on Barb's side of the, the fence, on the data side, so there's the, you know, there's, you know, what do we do to actually reduce our own carbon footprint in terms of how we operate our business? But then on the data side as well, what can we do now with more data, access to data, data, aggregated data for the creation of the products and now on cloud infrastructure, you can actually launch these products. So how are you creating new products? How are you managing the risk? And how are you actually um, working? So with Equinix, as an example, you're doing these great things. You need partners to actually then record that information for you so you can set your pledges. Um, you can report um, to your, your customers and your stakeholders, and you can measure against the pledges and commitments you're making. Um, so, you know, this is, this is an ideal place for, you know, just for the entire ecosystem, whether you're a bank, a tech provider, you know, public, a, a business, a end customer, this is one of those examples where we can all come together um, and leverage the investments of each other. So it is a very, um, it's a great opportunity. Yeah, thanks. Um, just a reminder to everybody, we're, we're nearly at the 30 minute mark of this 45 minute session panel. Uh, we would like to answer Q and A from the audience. Um, we've had one question in the Ask the Speaker section. If you want to do that on the right hand side and upload any any questions, I'm going to answer this one question now that I think I tried to answer, but my audio was chopped up. And but I'll I'll I'll, I'll each ask each of you to give your 30 second thing about what digital infrastructure is. What what are we talking about today? I, I, as I know, apologies if you picked it up earlier, but this is repeat, but just because the it's choppy. Um, you know, digital infrastructure is is very different than what what your mom and dad's data center um, was like. Um, is you know historically, uh, you would build your data center, put your mainframe in there, um, and, and run it yourself. But digital and you, and you would try to make that as cost effective as possible. But you always owned and it was always on digital infrastructure is this capability to turn things up, turn things down, whether it's the cloud with Azure running applications when you need them um, and, and, and bursting capabilities that you have there, or turning up network connectivity on Equinix Fabric. I think my audio is just chopping up again. Um, is another way to form a digital infrastructure. But it's also digital infrastructure can be through partners. So, Solero can provide you some of their capabilities for running your bank that you don't they have to now historically may have run in your own data center. If you're one of the you know a, a credit union in Canada, taking advantage of the server and not having to, to run it yourself is key. I'm breaking up again. So I'm gonna pass it off to Barb to, add, to, to fill in where you built what your definition of digital infrastructure. And I want to thank David for the question and thanks Lance for the handover. We actually are very proud to work with the team at Concentra. And I think it's a, a really good example and question to ask and answer because it is where we live at the perfect intersection then of the two partners that we're here with on the phone. So um, Dion described a little bit when he was coming in to evaluate, you know, sort of the technology estate that um, he was coming into at CWB and wanting to make sure that his application teams um, were unleashed in the future, that the infrastructure wasn't going to be their limiting factor. And that certainly is a very familiar story for us here in Solero, where when we think about the various platforms and applications that we run on behalf of credit unions and other customers, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're picking um, the place for that workload to run in the future that is most appropriate for it. Some of our applications are, um, you know, designed to operate in a certain way because that's how the vendor built them. And I would say that largely speaking, we're expecting that core banking systems uh, look like that. Um, you know, they've been designed with particular footprint in mind. They typically have required uh, fairly large servers to run them because we're thinking about peak capacity. 
what happens when you know the first of the month falls on a Friday, like April 1st did a couple of weeks ago. That's typically when all of the payroll is coming in and everybody's paying their bills at the same time because it's that perfect collision of everybody has a job to be done in their life, whether it's make sure they got paid so they can go get groceries or you know take and distribute that out to the babysitter because that's the week that they get paid. And so we've been traditionally in this place where you have to plan for and scale things to be accomplishing that peak load day. Um, and so there's some, um, you know, cloud and partner hosting providers that are best suited to run those applications. For Solero, that's a, an absolute truism. Our core banking systems are very well suited to be living in the IBM cloud and Barry from our partner Kindrel. Um, we have found that some of our other applications, like the ones that my team builds, so we're very concerned about, you know, surfacing up through performant APIs data to the right person at the right time. And so it was a very easy decision for us when we were evaluating where that workload was going to go to actually rewrite it from scratch using Azure native services. So it's a good example of Solero's hybrid uh, implementation and cloud strategy where we're determining the most appropriate solution and platform for the kind of workload that lives there. And so part of our organization can go live in an entirely cloud native serverless environment where we actually don't even need to care about the underlying infrastructure anymore because Microsoft worries about that. It's the shared responsibility that Tracy was talking about earlier. So infrastructure is code. Um, you were talking about compliance, of course, before. For us now, even compliance is code. We can be in a state of constant compliance instead of you know the week before the auditor shows up and everybody's trying to figure out, do we have all of our controls in place for them to come and see? They could actually show up at any time because we're able to demonstrate um, adherence to those controls at any point because now everything is code to us. And it comes back to the place where we first started in the discussion lens. That actually allows our team to move faster than we ever imagined that we could on behalf of our customers. But it, it also comes back to the point on sustainability. You know, we don't have to waste time putting people on an airplane to go run cables <laughs> in a data center because actually the Equinix team takes care of that for us. Right. So, you know, smart hands, being able to go and do that on our behalf, mitigating the risk of all of the supply chain concerns we've all seen. We actually don't have to worry about that anymore. Again, we can just move at the pace that we need to. And it's a pace that we never imagined. We are always now talking about, you know, minutes and hours instead of days and weeks and months. And we live in that place now. Right. The future is now and we, we live there now. Um, so it's extremely exciting and it actually ties back to the point Tracy talked about because it ultimately, as much as we like to think digital transformation of technology and it's an important element, it's about people. And we're very interested in ensuring we can bring the work to the people wherever they are. And that's now something that we can deliver upon, that we can have someone that lives in uh, Saskatoon that you know, doesn't have to be asked to move to a larger metropolitan area just to work there because that's where the office is or that's where the data center is. So now from a recruitment and retention standpoint, we can give the most modern tools to the people that are best equipped to use them wherever they are. Thanks, Barb. Some really, really good, clear examples there of, of the benefits of digital infrastructure. Dion, how is what you're doing different than how your mom and dad built data centers and built out infrastructures? How, did, how how are you defining digital infrastructure and how is it, how is it making things accelerate for you? Well, uh, that's a tough act to follow because I think, um, you know, I think you hit so many great points uh, there, Barb, um, and I agree with uh, all of them. Uh, for us, uh, what's key is the, the concept of sort of your mom and dad's data center uh, is changing for us, but it's not going away quite yet, which is why we still need to leverage a traditional uh, colo. Uh, for some of our, you know, more monolithic applications that um, still, uh, you know, have some life left in them, don't necessarily lend themselves well to uh, moving into public cloud unless they're, uh, you know, refactored and reinvented, which, you know, we are going to go down that path as well, right? Because I think there's lots of value that can be had. Uh, when I think of digital from an infrastructure perspective, it's it's all around sort of, I don't want to be the critical path for any of the projects that the application teams want to execute on. Um, I want to 
at all turns just be able to say yes we can do that and here's what the cost profiles are and here's how quickly uh, we can deliver uh, key for us as well is is the whole concept around software defined and what can we do to automate so many things that in the past uh, were very manual and uh, a lot of you know analysts uh, sort of interfacing directly uh, sometimes right in front of uh, traditional type infrastructure that we're trying to move away from uh, so much can be um, uh, added to the to the mix by um, you know by recognizing that that is going to exist for a little bit uh, provide that optionality but really move towards what the future is driving us to and be ready uh, when the application teams are ready as well so that's what it looks like a little bit of a different perspective but uh, very thematically the same very good thanks um, so, uh, Tracy, I'm gonna, there's another question by David Sutherland from Concentra, and thanks, Barb, for pointing out that he asked the last question. Um, here's, he said, have there been an economics gain, any economics gain in moving to uh, Microsoft Cloud infrastructure, or have the gains been measured in terms of capability? Have there been gains in security? Security is paramount, of course. So I think you're best qualified on the panel here to talk mm -hmm. about of course, there's, of course, there's economic gains. No, um, in all seriousness, um, yeah, I would. I. Uh, it's a subjective question. How would I say that? Um, so Microsoft actually has um, tools and assessments that can give you, um, and we do this for our customers all the time. We can give you an analysis of on-prem versus to cloud, and uh, what current state is, what an optimized state would actually look like, um, and we can definitely build. Um, the story for you with the data that would demonstrate an economic cost benefit analysis of going to the cloud. I think we've heard a couple of things on the panels today, though. Sometimes it is workload by workload. Um, sometimes it depends on the investment. A couple of the other sort of factors that we do get involved with, though, when we do look at um, the benefits or the economic benefits of cloud is also um, we talk about time to market. Um, one of the great examples that we have is a customer um, who actually did move um, their um, commercial, some of their commercial payments um, infrastructure to cloud. When you look at the length of time it takes to actually deploy one of those projects from potentially 18 months with lots of risk and changes um, throughout to a cloud deployment that's you know less than six months potentially, um, and we have a couple of those examples, you also do have to factor in those, I think, but again, that's where it comes back to the subjective nature of how you actually calculate your economic gains of uh, modern infrastructure. Um, but I would also say the other gains that come along are in terms of um, scalability, agility, launching products uh, more quickly. And of course, since this is a bit of a green panel, the ability to take advantage of things like renewable energy, efficient operations. Um, and so short answer is yes, there is a economic benefit to moving to cloud. Um, the caveat would be, I think it is is somewhat dependent on workload um, organization. Um, and so uh, I would I would love Dion or Barb to give me the customer point of view on that. And hopefully I didn't oversell it too much. <laughs> sure, I'll jump in. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll jump in on that. And, and the, 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 I hate to say, but the answer is it depends, right? So, um, and what's really interesting from a cost perspective, and, and I think this is a negative, which is actually a positive story here, is that, you know, and both in Equinix Metal and in uh, public cloud with Azure, it's, it's so relatively easy to stand up new infrastructure that you had better make sure your governance is in place to control that because it'll just get away on you quick from a dev and a test perspective and all of a sudden you'll be staring down um, large um, you know sort of large invoices because we have uh, lots of people that see the value of it and just um, uh, sort of run loose and and leverage it and and i think that's a that's a great thing uh, and it certainly reflects upon you know what it is um, that the public cloud can deliver from a you know from an agility um perspective right so i think that's a fantastic story but the, the point there is you need to make sure that you've got the governance around it to uh to be to be able to control it um 
And the other thing is, again, it depends on the application and its and its use, right? If if you if you aren't mindful of what it is that you're doing, the costs are likely going to be similar. Um, however, if you really are willing to dive in and leverage the cloud as it was intended to be used, then I think the cost savings are um, are and will be uh, enormous, right? Quite frankly, so uh, it's really up to us as end users to uh, determine what our you know what our future looks like. So, I think I'll maybe add Dion to say because I know David was curious about security, and it's probably quite a relevant topic considering we're at a banking and payments conference. You can't not think about that. It's actually the first thing you should be thinking about all the time. And you know, for us, as we consider the kinds of cloud native services we have available on the application side in Azure, uh, it actually starts to become very obvious to, to Dion's point. You know, think about the kind of global services like an Azure front door, right? That's the entry point into your entire Azure estate. And I think it's, you know, aptly named, but it, as you start to think about the kinds of capabilities that one single service gives you, and the kind of investment that Microsoft has made to get it to where it is. You know, Microsoft spends $20 billion a year on cybersecurity. Microsoft has trillions of points of triangulation of information that get fed into services like that. How are you going to stop a global scale DDoS on your infrastructure if you're living in Azure? Well, you really don't have to worry about it because you can add DDoS protection and it come built in the front door and it's leveraging those trillions of points of triangulation that you couldn't possibly surface up or manage or understand or have modeled against yourself. So, um, you know, security is absolutely the first thing that you think about if you're going into a public cloud. Um, I think it makes some folks nervous because of that word public. But I think you then also have to bring the team along with you or others that can start to describe, you know, the additional strength of security that that kind of defense in depth posture gives you. Gone are the days, you know, speaking of mom and pop infrastructure, right? We don't live in the castle walls with the moat anymore to protect us, right? That's just, that's simply not enough and it's not relevant for the kinds of work we do in banking and technology today. Um, you know, it, it's why it was an obvious decision for us to be working with on the application side, certainly Microsoft Azure team, because it is extremely appropriate and fit for purpose for Canadian financial institutions. We've got two regions that we can rely upon from a disaster recovery and completely high availability perspective. And a, a lot of investment at the individual tooling service capability level that is exactly what someone designing applications and experiences in financial services needs. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're at the end of our session here. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you panelists. Really appreciate you uh, participating. I hope everyone got something out of it. Um, you know, you want to scratch the surface. So, a couple of links up here if you want to take a screenshot or use your camera to build a QR code. We love to invite you to download some of the white papers we've got up on the, our Equinix booth about key trends in bank payments and banking infrastructure. We just released a white paper about banking as a service. We have some of our fellow reps attending the session, and we'd love to schedule a brief with you to talk. Bring, we'll come we'll bring in in Azure and talk side by side to the partner on this process. So thank you everyone and have a, a great day.